The sermon subject is entitled this evening, A Dream, A Death Decree, A Revelation. More than 2,500 years ago, Babylon ruled the world. In the days of Babylon, it was the educational center of the world. But it was based upon heathen philosophy. They had wise men, and of course, they consisted of those who were magicians, those who were astrologers, and those who were sorcerers. Now, the magicians were those who practiced magic and were comparable to our present-day fortune teller. And, of course, the astrologers were those who professed to be able to study the heavenly bodies and knowing that Babylon, king and queen, Nimrod and Samiris, Samirimus, they were the sun and moon goddess, Naturally, they studied the sun, the moon, and the stars, and they claimed to be able to reveal hidden secrets. And, of course, the sorcerers, they were supposed to communicate with the dead, from which they were supposed to give you vital information. King Nebuchadnezzar, as he lay on his royal couch, the thought came to him, here is this marvelous kingdom that my father and I have built upon the ruins of other kingdoms. Will it stand forever? What lies ahead? Maybe before he had retired, he may have looked into the glass and saw wrinkles on his face or gray hair coming in. That's a sign of old age, you know. By the way, do you know that the God of heaven took an account of what he was thinking and gave him a dream? The dream made such a profound impression upon him that when he awoke, he just couldn't recall it, but he knew it was of great importance. So these wise men in his realm were supposed to divulge anything he chose to know, so he called them in. And he said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. And they said, O oh, king, live forever. You just tell us what you've dreamed, and we will tell you the interpretation. He said, well, the thing is gone from me. But if you don't tell me what I've dreamed with the interpretation thereof, you're going to be cut in pieces, and your houses will be made a dunghill. They said, but king, if you will just tell us what you've dreamed. And old Nebuchadnezzar was quite wise because he recognized that if they could tell what the dream that he had dreamed, if they could divulge it, they certainly could tell the interpretation. So he said, if you don't tell me what I've dreamed, you're still going to be destroyed. But if you tell me what I've dreamed, I'm going to give you gifts, honor, and rewards. They said, listen, king. There isn't a man on the face of the earth that can divulge what you wish to know, except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. You know when you cross a dictator, and of course you see Babylon rule the entire world, and uh, he was indeed, his word was law. And when you cross the will of a dictator, you have encountered trouble. So, he said, I knew you'd just wait until you thought that this thing had slipped my mind, but... I'll issue the decree, and he did. And for this thing, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon should be destroyed. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. So, I haven't divulged what the dream is yet. Naturally, the very year that King Nebuchadnezzar had this dream. You see, they had taken captives from Israel. And Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been taken into captivity. 
When he came to power, when Nebuchadnezzar came to power, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these three, and Daniel had been in their schools, and naturally they were recognized as wise men. About a year after they had graduated, in order that the God of heaven might reveal himself, gave Nebuchadnezzar the dream. Now, if Daniel had had the dream, nobody would have believed it. But when the king had the dream, it brought about natural, that brought about uh, world attention. So, in those days, whenever a king had a dream, it was of grave importance because they felt, he being the leader, it was some divine omen. Well, naturally, I suppose Arioch, who was the captain of the guard, and by the way, the word Arioch means servant of the moon god, and they worshipped, you see, the moon and the sun. That's why their names are comparable. So he doubtless said, well, I'm going to go and get those Hebrews first and kill them. So they came to Daniel, and Daniel said, well, tell me what's the happening? Because Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were excluded when the wise men came in before the king to divulge his dream. Doubtless the God of heaven was in the plan to let the men prove their foolishness. And I want to say tonight there are thousands of people today who are going to fortune tellers trying to find out the future when the future lies with God in heaven. No wonder he says, remember the former things of old for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. Only God knows the future. God knows the end from the beginning. These fortune tellers could not divulge what the king had dreamed. And you know, if Satan could read the thoughts, he would have revealed to his servants what the king had dreamed. Only God can read your thoughts. I'm glad that God knows our thoughts. No wonder David says, O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. God understands your thoughts. But Satan doesn't. Satan's powerful, but God is mightier than he. Aren't you glad? When you're on the side of Jesus Christ, you're on the winning side. Listen. Daniel recognized the plight in which they found themselves. So he said to Arioch, well, why is this decree so hasty? Then Arioch let him know why. Because they pretended to be able to reveal hidden things and secrets and mysteries. And they were unable to do so. And this made the king furious. Well, Daniel, taking his life in his hand, went into the presence of the king. In the days of antiquity, if one went into the presence of the king without being invited, he could incur the death penalty. But you know, Daniel was a servant of God, and he'd been communing with God. Not just that day, he had known him for years. But do you know, he said to the king, if you give me time, I will tell you what you have dreamed and the interpretation. That's a lot of confidence in your God, isn't it? Here is a man who had the key and the hand of faith that unlocked heaven's storehouse, and when he prayed to God, something happened. So, friends, in the night season, after the three companions and Daniel began to pray, and I'm so glad to let you know that the God that you and I serve is a God that can hear prayer. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. 1 Peter 3.12. And you know, they were in trouble. And God makes another divine promise in Psalm 50, verse 15. He says, And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. So these men were praying. And then, friends... God gave Daniel a vision to reveal the very dream over which King Nebuchadnezzar was so greatly troubled. And not being ungrateful, you know, ingratitude is one of the great sins of our day. He didn't forget to say, thank you, Lord. So he thanked the Lord for revealing 
what he had made, the request that they had made. He arose and he said, Area, don't kill the wise men. And of course, you know, this included the wise men of Babylon also. I'm confident they were grateful to Daniel. He said, bring me in before the king. And of course, Daniel being a young man, the king didn't think too much about this young upstart telling me anything. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, what should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known unto thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes, which will make known the interpretation of the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Well, Daniel had already divulged more to King Nebuchadnezzar than the wise men had revealed. He said, you know, that is what I was thinking about. Now he sits there intently waiting to find out what he had dreamed to recall the dream because it had made such a profound impression upon him. Now, friends, I've read from verses 26 to 30 in the second chapter of Daniel. Now I'm reading from verse 31 because Daniel doesn't go over all the explanation that I'm giving. You see, your hindsight is better than your foresight. I'm giving you things that have already transpired. That's why I'm filling in everything. This is what he dreamed, and this is what Daniel tells him. Verse 31, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest, till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Don't be disturbed if I'm looking at you. I've got to look at somebody. This is real, you see. Don't get disturbed. You're my king tonight. By the way, come on out, Dick, stand up a minute. Just come out here to the front. I love him, fold your arms now. You, you know what I'm going to do with you, don't you? Now, I'm going to see what kind of Bible students you are. What did the king dream, and what was the head? and the breast and arms of silver, I guess. Is that right? And what was the belly and thighs? The legs? The feet? Say, he makes a pretty good image, you see. That head is almost gold, isn't it? Thank you, you're very good. Thanks so much. Now, friends, listen. The king knew this was the very dream over which he was so greatly troubled. And now he no longer had any doubt in his mind. He's waiting for an explanation. Friends, think of it. A head of gold, breast and arms of silver, silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet and toes, part of iron, and part of clay. Then he saw a stone that was hewn out without hands and smote the image upon his feet, and it was carried away into oblivion. Well, when the king awoke, he just couldn't recall what he dreamed. I suppose we've all dreamed things, and, well, I don't know what I dreamed last night. You see, Nebuchadnezzar was an idolater, and they worshipped images. And God gave him this image to make a profound impression upon him. Now, they'd worshipped gods of stone, gods of iron, 
gods of wood, but never a god like this of gold, silver, brass, iron, etc. So it did really shock him. Now, he tells him, and I want you to get the other point. Did you notice where Daniel says, we, not I will tell him. You see, he recognized that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been beseeching God, so God had answered all four of them. We will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. I like that, don't you? Listen, there is power in prayer, and especially when there's unity. When people are praying together, God hears. But follow me carefully. I'm now on verse 37, giving the explanation. While king sat on his throne, perhaps halfway off, Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Well, I suppose by this time Nebuchadnezzar is feeling very, very elated. Well, heaven has pictured me as gold. And you know, it made such a profound impression upon him. In the next chapter, he actually made not an image of gold, silver, brass, and iron, but he made a golden image, 90 feet high and 90 feet wide, and then issued a decree that everybody bow down and worship before it. So he was thinking quite highly of himself, but he had no reason over which to glory because Daniel said, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and great glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. In other words, the kingdom over which you are ruler is symbolized by this head of gold. Well, you know, friends, Babylon, indeed, was the golden city of a golden age. Never a kingdom like it. You see, when Lucifer was thrown out of heaven with a third of the angels, he had lived in the holy city, New Jerusalem, so he desired to pattern the earthly Babylon after the holy city, New Jerusalem. Now, the holy city, New Jerusalem, lies four square. 1,500 miles in circumference. Well, of course, the devil can never keep up with God. He, is, he can't do this, nor can anyone else. They may think they can, but no friends. So they had Babylon laid out in a perfect square. 15 miles each way are 60 miles in circumference. The richest kingdom the world has ever known. Somebody says, wait a minute, Spears. What about Solomon's kingdom? Well, don't forget... It was Nebuchadnezzar who went down to Jerusalem and took all the wealth that Solomon possessed and brought it back to Babylon. So Babylon contained all the combined riches of the then known world. The Bible recognizes Babylon as the golden city. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. Isaiah 14, verse 4. Yes, Babylon was indeed the golden city. I don't think perhaps it would be wrong to give you just a vivid description of the city. You talk about beautiful streets. They had streets running north and south and east and west. Do you know what? Do you know they had 50 streets and they were 50, 150 feet wide? Do you understand that they crossed each other at right angles and at the end of each of those streets there were solid brass gates polished so highly that they looked like gold? And then running diagonally through the city was the great river Euphrates. And they had a drawbridge to take you from one section to the other. According to Herodotus, the Greek historian, and many certainly dispute his figures, but he said the wall was 350 feet high. It had to be at least 150 feet high because rubble has been nearly that. But be that as it may, it was supposed to have been 87 feet thick. It was considered the impregnable city and Nebuchadnezzar built it to stand for eternity. Friends, 
he had those hanging gardens that would rise from terrace to terrace until they reached the height of the wall, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. They had two royal palaces that connected under a subterranean tunnel, under the river, and these palaces, one was three and a half miles in circumference, the other eight miles. We think that we're very modern, but they had everything in those days. Then, friends, they worshipped mountains, they worshipped idols, so they even had a mountain whose base was 600 feet square, and it arose 600 feet in the air, so much soil that they actually had a wilderness growing on there, and it was watered by slaves underneath. Do you recognize, friends, that this also could be seen for hundreds and hundreds of miles before you arrive, making a deep impression upon the beholder? Then, friends, I want you to know they had beautiful parks, you talk about palatial homes, we don't have anything. They had it, friends. It was indeed the golden city. But the God that you and I serve, uh, more than a hundred years before it came into prominence, before it was even in the ruling of the world, God had also predicted its doom. You know, pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a what? You're good Bible students. Proverbs 16, verse 18. And Babylon, and Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellence shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited. Did you get that? Say, I love that because tonight it is not inhabited just like God's word said. Though Babylon grew to be one of the most marvelous, and the capital city was called Babylon, it ruled the known world. And friends, they, you take all the wisdom, they had it. Much of the learning of Greece came from Babylon. Most people think Greece had everything, but most of this came from Babylon. Do you recognize, dear friends, that this great city was not to stand forever because God says, and Babylon the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellence shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And friends, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah doesn't exist today, and God said that that city would not exist, and it isn't. It's only for wild creatures today, not inhabited by anyone, but be that as it may. By the way, I read Isaiah 13, verse 19, and it's read the first clause of the 20th verse. Some night I'll go into the 20th verse maybe in a prophecy, but I won't do it tonight, but follow me. If we have any skeptics here tonight, if you, don't, if you really want to know God's program, God knowing the end from the beginning, and I contend if the men in Washington, the brain trust, if the men who counsel President Carter knew the word of God and the prophecies instead of sending billions of dollars to foreign countries with which to destroy one another, they would send preachers and teachers to prepare men for the soon coming of Jesus. Do you know, friends, this is one of the most sublime prophecies in the world. Beautiful prophecy. Did you know that after this world stood, I should say this, uh, the United States had stood for 150 years, the 30th president, by the way, who was he? And the 29th man wrote after the United States was 150 years old, a 500 word describing it, and they said, this is marvelous. But in 267 words, Daniel the prophet describes not only the United States, he describes the history from the time of Babylon until time shall be no longer in 267 words. So he gave the history for 2,000 500 years in 267 words. Say, only God could do that. Don't you know that? No man can do that. By the way, I was going to give you a gift if you knew who that was, so I won't tell you. I'm, I was very liberal. Really, I was going to give you a nice gift tonight if somebody had told me. That was Calvin Coolidge. He was the 29th man but the 30th president. You see, Grover Cleveland was the 22nd and the 24th president, and that's why it made him the 29th man, but the 30th president. Am I making it plain? 
friends, and he was recognized as a very, very brilliant man, and they said, this marvelous, writing the history of the United States in only 500 words. When God takes hold of a man, he gives a history for 2,500 years in 267 words. Tell me there isn't a living God, I know he lives. Listen, but more, there's something even more marvelous about this prophecy. 150 years before Cyrus was born, God called him by name, and 174 years before he took the city. This is the kind of book I love. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leap gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut and sunder the bars of iron, and I will give unto thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I am the Lord which called thee by thy name. Say, God called Cyrus by name a hundred and fifty years before he was born, or one hundred and seventy-four years before the city was taken. Isaiah 45, verses 1 to 3. Isn't that some food for thought for some skeptics? But I'm not through. Do you know those walls being so high, and even where the river ran was walled, they had brass gates there also. So Cyrus, disguised as a servant, and went in to explore how can I subdue this great, great city. He saw that he didn't have any airplanes and he had nothing that could penetrate 87 feet of concrete, so he knew about their Bacchanalian festival. You see, Bacchus was their great god of grape sowing and wine. And at their Bacchanalian festival, they were drinking wine and drunk. And he says, this is the night I will strike. So Cyrus, the great, had one group of soldiers as the water ran into the city and another group where the water emerged. Then he took the th another third of his soldiers 15 miles above the city and at a given hour turned the river Euphrates out of its course. Now, of course, that basin was there because they had been digging, making those hanging gardens for which Babylon was famous. And when it was permissible for them to go by on dry land or muddy enough to walk through that riverbed, do you know because of their drunkenness, they forgot to shut the gates? And God's prophecy says, and the gates shall not be shut. Friends, even these minute details are all fulfilled in God's word. That night, instead of Belshazzar being the king the next morning, he was destroyed. You say, Spears, I've read history. Some of this I know, you, I've read in history, so I know you're telling the truth. But uh, where do you associate this with the Bible? I want you to know, friends, that profane or secular history only confirms what divine word, the divine word of God says. Am I making it plain? And I don't need to go to an encyclopedia. I don't, know, I don't need to go to a history book to prove this because God makes it very evident which power would rule the world after Babylon had come to its close, after Babylon had been defeated. This is marvelous. But you remember, Daniel doesn't stop and do all the explaining that I'm doing. He says in verse 39 of the second chapter of Daniel, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. So Nebuchadnezzar knew that there was going to be another kingdom after Babylon. Well, let me tell you what happened. That night, Belshazzar was slain. You know, he had a feast for a thousand of his lords, and they were drinking in those sacred vessels that they'd brought from Jerusalem. Gods of wood and stone, etc., with their wives and concubines, and the writing came on the wall. Belshazzar saw it, his knees began to smite, and he called for the wise men. The wise men couldn't read the writing, but Daniel, who had been God's man, could understand his heavenly father's handwriting, and he told them what it meant. And in Daniel 5, verse 25 and onward, gives you what it was. And this is the writing that was written. Meany, meany, 
Hikul Yufars. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mini, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Hikul, thou art weighed in the balances and are found wanting. Peris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. In that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain, and Arias the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. Daniel 5, verses 25 to 28, and verses 30 and 31. So God's holy book tells us that after Babylon, Medo-Persia would rule the world, symbolized by the arms of dual power. God's a master artist, you see. Then, friends, for about 207 years, Medo-Persia ruled the world. But you see, when a man is a warmonger, they are never satisfied. They want more. Just like a man who has wealth, he wants more. So Xerxes made war against the Grecians. And wars only encourage more war. It causes hatred and bitterness. Well, I want you to know that Philip of Macedon finally came to be the leader of Greece. And he had an undying hatred for the Medes and Persians. And he says, I'll avenge the Persians if it's the last thing I will, I will do. I will destroy them if it's the last thing I will do. Well, you know, while one time he was at the feast of his daughter's marriage, he declared himself as having descended from Hercules and he was assassinated. But before he died, he called Alexander to his side and told him what his plans were and told him, I want you to take the Greek phalanx that I have established, these marvelous soldiers, and I want you to go and destroy the Medes and Persians. Well, of course, Alexander gladly acceded to his father's request. He was at the age of 20, a very brilliant man. In fact, he had sat three years at the feet of Aristotle, so he was a real genius. To remember, friends, the last clause of verse 39, God brings that out too. And another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. So God makes it plain that after Medo-Persia, another kingdom, and the Bible makes it plain that it was Greece. Friends, history will tell you this, but divine history is even more accurate. Don't you love it? Listen, friends. When... Greece encountered the Medes and Persians. There were really three great engagements. The Battle of Granicus, May 22nd, 334 BC. Then the Battle of Issus in November 333 BC. And then the final battle, the Battle of Arbela, 331 BC, at which time the Grecians only had 30,000 men. The Medes and Persians had one million men. Well, you say that man's crazy, fighting a million people with 30,000 people. But you know, God had already decreed, and another third kingdom of brass, which will bear rule over all the earth. Bless your hearts. In that great battle, there, we're told by historians, this is the first time elephants were used in battle. But you know, God's word goes on. Now I'm reading verse 40 of Daniel Verse 2, chapter 2, Daniel 40, I mean, Daniel 2, verse 40. Now follow me carefully. Friends, follow me carefully. Notice what it says here. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and subdue. And that you may know that after Medo-Persia, Greece ruled the world, the Bible says, then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, behold, the prince of Grecia shall come. Daniel 10, verse 20. So friends, God's word makes it plain. Now, you have no record in the Old Testament which power doesn't identify them. Of course, in Daniel 8, it does give its description. But do you know, and also hear this iron monarchy. Do you know that the word of God makes it plain who the fourth kingdom was that was to rule the world? If I were to ask you, you'd tell me. What would you tell me? Come on. You got that out of history, didn't you? That's what I was taught in history. But you know, divine history makes it even more evident. Notice what it says in Luke 2, verse 1. Luke 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Now, any emperor that can tax the whole world rules the whole world. This is why 
the night on which Jesus, your Savior and mine, was born, was found in Bethlehem because the decree had gone forth that all the world should be taxed. Yes, friends, Rome was the fourth king. But you know, Daniel doesn't stop with this. It was Rome that crucified your Savior. It was Rome that destroyed all of the innocent babes, two years old and under, seeking to destroy Christ. But our friends, God was in the plan and his son was spared. You remember how God had warned Joseph to take him on down to Egypt? Yes, friends, this is the kind of book I love. But follow me. Rome wasn't to stand forever. For notice verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. So, friends, Rome was to be divided between the years of 351 and 476 A.D. Rome was invaded by the barbarians, if you'd call them, or the Germanic tribes, from the north and the east and the very spot where Rome ruled the world in Western Europe, they established 10 kingdoms represented by those 10 toes. Listen, friends, again I say God is a master artist. Now, do you know that seven of those kingdoms are still over in Western Europe tonight? And some night when I talk on the subject, the man who played God, God even reveals why they are not there. This is a marvelous book. But follow me, those ten toes represent the ten divisions into which Rome was finally divided. The Franks, the French, the Alemanni, the Germans, the Burgundians, the Swiss, the Suevi, the Portuguese, the Vandals in northern Africa, the Visigoths, the Spanish, the Anglo-Saxons, the English, the Ostrogoths, the Austrians, the Lombards in northern Italy, and the Herulies in southern, southern Italy. These are the ten divisions into which Rome was divided, just as God said those ten toes. I mean, by the way, how many toes do you have on both of your feet? That's what this image had. Now, friends, follow me carefully. Follow me carefully. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. That's verse 42. You know, we talked a lot some years ago about the Iron Curtain, worrying about communism because they control one-third of the world. Friends, forget it. Communism isn't going to rule the world. There have only been four universal kingdoms since the day of Babylon. And by the way, not the United States, nor any other power will ever rule the world again. I have God's word and God's authority, and I can speak with authenticity because what God's word says. But friends, listen. You see, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Rome back together again. God says they would be partly strong and partly broken. I want to show you this, all these little minute points, how God's word has been so literally fulfilled. There are seven of those kingdoms left over in Western Europe. There's Spain, there's Switzerland, Sport, uh, Switzerland, Portugal, and Spain. Weak, aren't they? Now, the strong ones are England, France, and Italy. Partly strong, partly weak. And Germany is divided, and it's part strong and part weak. Friends, only God could look 2,500 years ago in the, in the future and it's give the status of the countries over in Europe just as they are tonight. Ah, oh, don't worry. God says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Isaiah 55, verse 11. Listen, friends, I'm not through. Verse 43 says, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. You know, iron and clay will not cohere. It doesn't stick together. But you know, since Rome was divided, there have been men saying, well, I'm going to do something about it. So... Charles the Great or Charlemagne in the 8th and 9th century tried to unite Europe together and rule as they did in the days of Caesar. In fact, on the 25th day of December, 
AD, in 800 AD, the Pope of Rome put a crown on his head and with their divine favor for him to conquer the world. And friends, that man fought until he died, but he still didn't rule the world. And then, friends, you take, it was Charles V also tried it in the 16th century. He also failed. And then I think of Napoleon Bonaparte. You know, that mighty man. Oh, friends, what a mighty warrior. You know, he said, I will conquer the world within five years. But you know, he took his best soldiers and he had, perhaps, there was Germany, Poland, etc. They were all at his feet. I will conquer Russia. And he took, friends, his best troops and tried to make war. He found out that God even defeated his plan by sending generals January and February and his soldiers froze to death and he went back a defeated man, but he still wasn't willing to give up. Then he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make war again and I will conquer the world. And you know the great battle of Waterloo. He had planned that by six o'clock I'll start the war, by two it will all be over. And you know God says they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. The only woman that he ever loved was Josephine and he divorced her because she didn't have children. He said either I will be king or my son. And friends, he made an alliance with Francis II of Austria and he married his daughter Princess Maria Louise. Friends, so he was trying to intermarry. He says, I'll tell you that blood is thicker than water, so I'm going to marry. I'll have this fixed up so that we'll all be relatives and I'll rule the world. But friends, did you know at the Battle of Waterloo, Francis II was in the coalition against him? And then, friends, you know, he also had an alliance with von Blucher, who was one of the Prussian leaders, one of the generals. And do you know that he also turned against him? And you know, it was Lord Wellington at the Battle of Waterloo. Yes, yes, he had plenty of genius. He had the military strength, and he had heavy artillery, and he couldn't win without it. But what did God do? You know, see, God has a thousand ways to defeat man. God only opened up his arsenals and sent down General Rain. He couldn't win without using his heavy artillery. And friends, it rained. He didn't start the battle at six, seven, eight, nine, or 10, or 11, because it rained. And as a result, Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo. Am I making it plain? And then there's only one man. I could go on. There was Kaiser Wilhelm. But there's only one man I know that could holler louder than myself, and that was Hitler. You remember, he came along. He said he was going to rule the world. But you know, friends, he almost did it. Almost, but not quite. At the Battle of Dunkirk. You remember in 1940, May 15, the, the alliances of churches got together and they called upon his majesty, uh, King of England, uh, through his Prime Minister Church, uh, uh, Prime Minister Churchill, to set aside a day of prayer. Well, they set aside the 26th of June for that prayer. Do you know, friends, within three days after they began beseeching God, God began to work on behalf of God's people? Do you know that Hitler would have won the war in World War Number 2 if God had not intervened and sent a heavy cloud down to shadow God, the people, the allies? There were 335,000 men there at Dunkirk who didn't have ammunition or food. Friends, this wasn't the first time that God had shielded his people. You remember when Israel was going out, when they were leaving Egypt? God again put a cloud between his people and protected them. Friends, God has a thousand ways to cause his word to be fulfilled. Then, friends, I want you to know we are living in the days of those kings that are over in Western Europe. And verse 44 says, And in the days of these kings, what kings? in the days of France, Germany, Britain, etc. And in the days of these kings, 
shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Say, the fifth world kingdom is to be the kingdom that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, is to soon to establish. No world power will ever rule the world again. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. You know why it will never be destroyed? Because he is an immortal king, and thank God those who will be subject to that kingdom will also be immortal. For at the second coming of Jesus, those who are serving the Lord Jesus Christ will have the gift of immortality bestowed upon them. No wonder Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Thank God this is an everlasting kingdom. It's an immortal kingdom. Thank God because the king and the inhabitants will be immortal. And friends, just like that stone smote the image on its feet, not on the head, not, upon, not in the breast and arms, but the stone smote the image upon his feet in the days of the kings over in Western Europe. Friends, when you follow the contour of a man's figure, from the head to the toes, you've come to the end, haven't you? This is where we are in the stream of time. We are at the end of earth's history. It's time for you and me to prepare to meet our God. Notice what it says again in verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. So you don't have to question the authenticity of this book. It's sure. Just like God said more than 2,500 years ago, history is being fulfilled to the very iota, just as God said. This is how I know the God that I worship and love is the true and living God, and this is God's book. Listen. That stone and the coming of Jesus Christ are identical. Just like the kingdom and the second coming of Christ are identical. You can find this in 2 Timothy 4.1. It says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So his appearing and his kingdom are identical in point of time. The stone smiting the image represents Jesus. Jesus said to them, did you never read the scriptures that the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Matthew 21, verse 42 and verse 44. Friends, do you remember when Peter was preaching? Peter said, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom he crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you hold. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. Did you get the point? So he recognized that Jesus Christ was that stone, and it was by his power that this man was healed. This is the stone which is set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. And then he says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the stone or the rock of ages. Question tonight is, do you know Jesus as your Savior? 
Have you made your, taken out your citizenship for the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem? That's the big question. Listen. I want you to know that in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. And I kind of like the way Daniel puts it in Daniel 7, 27. Daniel said, and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. We've been praying that prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. When Jesus Christ establishes the fifth world kingdom, all the earthly kingdoms will be destroyed. God will renovate the earth and friends the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. I want to be there, don't you? Tonight, I couldn't close this service without giving someone in this congregation an opportunity to either accept Jesus as his or her savior or to return to Jesus if you have once known him and you've striven from the way of righteousness. Or if you'd like to take out your citizenship and become a child of God, I'm inviting you to take Jesus as your rock and cling to him.